Thanks, James. You uh, said the words that I was hoping you would say, I guess. No, no. <laughs> hey, it's so good to just experience the presence of the Lord today. And, and uh, you know, we just came, came out of 21 days of fasting and prayer. And we did a Daniel fast. And I just want to thank all of you that just really, I, let me just say I'm thankful for all of you that just stepped into this as a church body, just to pursue God's heart at the beginning of this year. And then, boy, last Sunday, we had a celebration. Wasn't it wonderful? Wasn't that great? Just a, the, oh my goodness, it was, it was so, so wonderful and powerful. And just as we saw the different expressions of worship and from different nations. And, uh, but you know what? We're not just limiting ourselves to that. We're going to keep on pursuing God's heart. And this last week, the prayer gatherings were so powerful and just so wonderful because I believe that that's what God's called us to, to be a house of prayer. Don't you agree? And uh, we want to encourage you to keep fasting. It, you know, if you took Wednesdays, and I'd love to challenge you to take Wednesdays and fast a meal just to pray. Maybe it might be your your lunchtime, and you just can find a place, maybe it's in your cubicle or at your desk or maybe it's in your car, and just go and find a place to pray. Years and years ago when I was in college, I, I was working in a, in a warehouse, and, and it worked evenings, and I would, there was this time that when I felt, I just really believed that God had something more for us and for me, and I would go out to my car around sunset at that that's what I remember at our break time. And I would take like one day a week and just go out there and just pray and seek the Lord. I want to encourage you. It blessed me. I believe it helped me so much through difficult and challenging times. It's not because I'm trying to get God's attention. It's that I want to give him my attention. Isn't that right? We want to, we want, I believe 2024, you're going to see great things from at the hand of the Lord moving in our midst because I believe that there's, that there's something that's stirring within us that just is increasing, uh, just an increasing hunger for his presence. I also believe that it's going to be challenging times. We all know that. And uh, I can be prophetic, and yet at the same time, I think that all of us understand that the, there, this is a year, of course, of elections. And this is a time where I believe that there will be challenges that, they're in front of us, but boy, we've got we've got an opportunity to show the presence of the Lord to a lost and dying world. Isn't that right? And so it happens as we're worshiping together. And, and uh, I'm so thankful for our mission team that's going to be going to Ecuador. All these young people going to Ecuador. And so, you know. James mentioned February 12th, Cain's Catering. I was going to call a fast on that day, but maybe not now. <laughs> but uh, it's also, that's a great time to connect together. Um, let me just get right into this. Father, thank you so much. We thank you. It just seems like there's a sense of worship and proclamation that's been happening. It's like all through the worship, there was proclamation that was coming and, and just this encouragement that was coming and, and direction that was coming out of the worship team and out of those who are leading us in worship. But we all sense the vibration of the kingdom of heaven. We sense, we, all of us, know we know according to your word that when we come together, you are with us. And you were with us before we came. But boy, there's something that happens when we join our hearts together. So Lord, we ask that today, the goal, of the, the purpose of this word that you've given me is that you would make us one. Amen. I want to get right into the scripture today. I want to begin by going to 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. 1 Corinthians 12, in, it, it describes all of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's a powerful, powerful teaching 
on how the Holy Spirit moves amongst us. And, and, uh, and we're all lo- learning and growing in that as well. And a lot of that happens in small groups. It happens when we're together, uh, praying together. But uh, even occasion- then we'll have t- these times where the gifts of Spirit happen within the context of worship, like we experience today. And that's found in 1 Corinthians 12. Oh, like where there's a word of knowledge or a prophetic word. In other words, a word, a prophetic word can be telling about the future, but it can also be encouraging us. It's encouraging, and uplifting, and strengthening. So when we hear that, that's good. But at the very end, of after all of the gifts of the Spirit are being explained and how the body all works together, it comes to this scripture and it says, I show you a more excellent way. I think it's on the on a PowerPoint. And yet I will show you a more excellent way. Well, in the next few weeks, well, in within the future, I I don't know all the all the messages that'll come, but in the future, we're gonna be just really focused on this more excellent way. Then at the end, 1 Corinthians 12, after this scripture says, I'll I, I want to show you something even more excellent. More excellent than all the gifts of the Spirit. More excellent than how all the the way the gifts function in the church. Here's something that's more excellent. And then it goes into 1 Corinthians 13. And it begins to say, you can, if you have the gift of prophecy and understand all things, think of this. If you have the gift of prophecy, And understand all things. In other words, even if you are so spiritual, so spiritual that you have this this understanding of all things and you have the gift of prophecy, but if you do not have love, you're just making a noise. Oh my. The more excellent way is how to walk in love. And it describes love bears all things, believes all things, love hopes all things. Love isn't easily offended. It doesn't hold on to grudges. It, it's not touchy. It's not feely. It's, you know, it, it's not always, you know, the way I used to be. <laughs> and I do still have my moments. Somebody say amen. <laughs> it's so do you, by the way. A more excellent way is that we walk in love. This is so important because it's the unity. It's how we function with each other. It's how we can bear with each other and forgive each other and and love each other and not be always with a critical spirit and always judgmental and always just pointing out the fallacies of this and that. And it doesn't take long to be around me for any length of time to see those weaknesses. and, and, uh, And by the way, when we see our own weaknesses and we're humbling ourselves, we, for, we ask for forgiveness and, and we, we, uh, we f- we're filled with grace and mercy and it works both ways. And, and so it's so important that we understand this. Psalm 133 says, how good and how pleasant it is for God's people to dwell together in unity. And then it's only three verses long in that chapter. The final verse says, for there the Lord commands his blessing. Just think of it. Our unity together when we are in unity, God says, I'm going to command my blessing there. It's like, it's not as though we're just saying, Lord, would you bless us? It's when we love each other, when we can be forgiving and merciful. And we be, by the way, the, that 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter is also, we could call it the mature chapter. 
Because it's a description of people who walk in maturity and they're not any longer childish. We grow in maturity. We grow emotionally. And we begin to love God with all of our heart, soul, and mind. And we love each other. And so the challenge is, this says this, that we would, when we would walk in this kind of a relationship where we love each other, this unity, God says when we are together in this unity, and there's a Hebrew word there that describes it as harmony. It's like all of these diverse notes coming together on a, on, on a piano and and those diverse notes all began to fit together and harmonize. And not one, it's not just one voice. It's not just one way. It's, it's the unity. It's the, it's the harmony of people who are different from each other, and yet they love each other. That's why I celebrated last Sunday, and I celebrate you all the time. I was in a meeting in, a, in the Twin Cities. A, a, there was a large gathering of, of uh, pastors and, and leaders uh, of all different ministries. And Cindy Jacobs was there, and, and uh, she did a prophetic act. Um, first of all, they started, somebody was teaching and saying how on Sunday mornings, they were saying this. I've, you've probably heard this before. But on Sunday mornings, it's the most... It's the most segregated time in the city. And they were describing how people will go to their jobs or their schools or, or, their, or their workplace, wherever it is, they will go there, a ball game. Or, and there are people of all different races that will be there. But they said on Sunday mornings, it's like everybody goes to their own kind, their own church. And they pause for a moment. And one of the leading bishops that was sitting in the front row, one of the leaders of this meeting, stood up and said, not at Redeeming Love Church. I was blown. I'm sitting, you know, halfway back, and I went, oh, my goodness. And just a week before, he had been here on a Sunday morning. And somehow it rose up within him. Of course, you know, I want to tell you that because I'm so thankful for you. And at that moment, my heart was so, oh, with people around me going, yeah, hey, might, you know, and I'm going, yeah, well, you know, we had a lot to do with that, you know. Uh, we did diversity training and we intention. None of that happened here, by the way. We never did diversity training. We never said, there was never a time in our history where we said, you know what? Let's work together and develop a strategy to make it so that all nations would worship. We never did that. But one thing we purpose to do is reveal the redeeming love of God in the spirit of harmony and humility. And we didn't even know when we were doing that how we would track people from all different nations. And I love that. Just a moment ago, I'm going to point out the obvious, just to point this out. Just a moment ago, one of our faithful prayer leaders, a 93-year-old white woman, was praying with a, a young black woman standing here during our prayer time and our worship time. And she's this 93-year-old white woman with white hair. She's, she's beautiful. She's been a faithful faithful part of our prayer ministry, and she's, and I ask her, to, I'm going to ask her right now in front of everybody to forgive me for pointing her out. <laughs> oh, she's shaking her head, no. But anyhow, <laughs> you know what, she's been blessing. But I saw that, I thought to myself, we, that was a beautiful picture of what God's doing here. I want to encourage you, friends. I want to encourage you that God is doing something beautiful and is orchestrated from heaven, not because of what we've done. And I don't take it for granted. And there's so many times I'm just overwhelmed with the sense of, oh God, we get to be a part of this. You know, last week was a picture of heaven. 
somebody, several people said that. When we get to heaven, I don't believe for one moment, when we're standing before the throne of God, that there's going to be angels saying, okay, now let's separate. Um, you know, Filipinos, you're over on this side. You know, and Hmong, you're over on this side. Africans, you take up that area. You Norwegians and Swedes, I'm sorry, but you have to go to the back. Um, <laughs> And you Irish in Belgium, you get right up at the front. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm having fun here, but, but you understand what I'm saying, right? But now listen. But listen. The, the blessing of God is commanded to where there's unity. That unity is a harmony. It's when we're diverse and we're, we understand we are diverse. And last week we saw that. But it's when in our diversity we love each other. When we can, when we can love each other. But listen, if, if, if the blessing is commanded in its fullness where we are in unity, where there's a lack of unity, you are seeing a lack of the blessing, according to that scripture, Psalm 133. In other words, if, and by the way, I, I just believe in God's grace, and he is so merciful to us, and he's graceful. But according to that scripture, it looks like the commanded blessing is conditional upon us walking in unity. Why is that? Because being in one accord is attractive to the presence of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12 will not happen in power where there is a lack of 1 Corinthians 13. On the day of Pentecost, they were all in one accord. That's when the church was birthed, when they were all, the whole church all over the world and all over the universe, the whole church was together in one accord. Sandy and I, for the last six years, almost, almost everywhere we go, we go in one accord. It's a Honda, but still. <laughs> now that was classic. <laughs> Actually, I shared that just to test if you would be in unity with me today. So, <laughs> But you know what? The reality is when they were together in harmony, it drew the Holy Spirit. If that's the case, could it be and no, I'm saying it is. That the enemy of your soul wants to weaken you and your house. So he puts little things in your heart against your husband, against your wife. And they come across as attitudes. Attitudes that we would never, ever share with another person. And we talk to one another in our houses in a way that we would never talk to our good friends in our prayer groups. We sin by our attitudes. We find it easier to forgive other people than it is the people closest to us. And we hold on to offense, and it stays in our mind, and it creates a separation you know why? It's not flesh and blood. Yes, we do have to take responsibility for our own attitudes. But ultimately, it's the enemy of your soul who wants to weaken your house because Jesus said, a house divided against itself will not stand. Even with all that God's been doing here, I would say to you, there's still things that we got to deal with that separate us. It's too easy for us to be offended. 
It's too easy for us to be separated. Last Sunday, you know, all the different ministry, all the different cultures came up and led in worship. Um, you might have been thinking, it could have been a thought that crossed your mind. I like that kind of worship, but I don't like that kind of worship. This kind of worship makes me feel uncomfortable in that culture. This kind of worship I can embrace. I like that. Okay, I liked our worship team at the beginning, but I'm not sure about how we were all dancing at the end. And so what happens is we tend to judge without realizing it, and we criticize according to not prejudice, but preference. Now listen, God's powerful presence. Now listen carefully. God's powerful presence is just on the other side of our willingness to surrender our personal preference. I'm going to say it one more time. Is it okay? God, God's powerful presence is just on the other side of our willingness to surrender our personal preference. Without realizing it, we can have racial, we, excuse me, we don't have racial prejudice, but do we at times have racial preference? Woo, now listen, I'm going to be careful on this, lest anybody right now is, would feel condemned. It's not condemnation, it's conviction. Now, listen. Listen to this carefully. I'm not saying that the preference is sin. What I'm saying is we cannot let our preferences keep us from his presence. We, can, we cannot let our preferences in worship style keep us from unity. Do you understand? Now, we all went out to eat after in, in we had this taste of ROC, right? Not everybody's food there was my preference. No offense. Do you understand? We tend to like the foods that we grew up with, and so we have a preference, and that's not a sin. It is if we allow it to divide us. We are called to, to a, a, a special unity. And here's what Jesus said in John 17. It was his prayer. Put it up on the screen. God, Jesus prayed this to the Father. He says, Father, I've given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. Think about the unity that he has with the Father. That's the kind of unity he's calling us into, where, where we're so one that instead of having a critical, judgmental, offended spirit, where we begin to pray for one another, we pray for people who despitefully use us, we pray, when we bear with one another. Ephesians 4, we make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bonds of peace. We're not going to allow offense to divide us. We're not going to allow preference to divide us. Next verse, he said, I and them and you in me, so that they may be brought to what? Say it out loud. Complete unity. When that happens, the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you love me. The world will know and experience the love of God when you and I walk in complete unity. That complete unity cannot happen without the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's here right now. Hallelujah. So I want to show a video. It's going to take a little bit, six minutes, and then we're going to close with doing communion. But it's called the Miracle of Memphis. The Pentecostal movement really started with a 
uh, coming together of the races at Azusa Street. The Cobbler line had been erased at Azusa Street, but it was redrawn uh, through the years. The Pentecostal movements between Anglo and African American drifted apart. There was not much of any relationship. There had been instances of uh, brutality and racism that had impacted the uh, black people of our nation and the races were divided, especially our Pentecostal and conservative Christian brethren who had not participated to any great degree in the efforts to obtain civil rights and freedom uh, for black people in the United States. Uh, the Jews and, and the Methodists and the Episcopals um, had rushed to our side during the demonstrations and they were involved but we were kind of uh, broken by those who were most like us theologically and doctrinally were furthest away from us in terms of the fight for uh, civil rights. So the Memphis meeting in 1994 uh, was really historic in that it was bringing together again the sons and daughters and the grandchildren of the Azusa revival. It was a truly uh, remarkable and emotional event. There, there was indeed an electricity in the atmosphere. Well, coming to the meeting was an unusual experience. These were not the individuals that we were accustomed to associating with. Uh, they were not individuals whom we knew well because we had had little involvement uh, with one another. In looking around, quite frankly, I didn't know most of the uh, African Americans uh, probably only knew one in the whole group, which was the shame of the, the great divide that occurred, you know. It was a learning experience for both whites and blacks. At Memphis, I learned it's not just sin to actively participate in sin, it's sin to see sin and remain silent and do nothing. And so I was particularly hurt uh, when I heard the stories of black leaders expressing their hurt at the absence of the white church during the civil rights movement. Uh, in essence, it was, a, it was a time of brokenness because the whites had some uh, repenting to do and some forgiveness to seek. We also had some repenting for prejudices that might have existed in our hearts and resentments that might have been within us. Most of us who were white, I think, would have rather pray over the past and just go on to the future. And that's why I had this sense that if God didn't do something, that uh, we were raking, raking the scabs off of some old wounds to those minorities with us. They weren't old scabs. They were running sores. And that's why it had to be said. If my memory serves me correctly, a, a white minister, Don Evans, uh, just uh, spontaneously had, had managed to secure a basin with some water. I remember praying that uh, as it was the act of one Brother Parham who caused an offense to our Brother Seymour. So can there be one act? Will not erase all that has been but it will establish a new beginning in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And I would represent a white humanity in all of its ugliness and now all of its honorable effort to begin anew. Uh, I know our own general superintendent at the time, Thomas Trask, said to, uh, uh, to Bishop Charles Blake of the Church of God in Christ that uh, he wanted to wash Bishop Blake's feet, and Bishop Blake responded that, If you wash mine, uh, you, I've got to wash yours, or else you can't wash mine. And so he agreed, and he washed my feet, and I washed his feet. It was a time of tears and, and weeping before the Lord and repentance and uh, begging God to forgive us. And that was the tone that was created. Walls were broken down, we ate together, we talked together, uh, and we found ourselves coming together in a very, very special way. There was such a, a spirit of tenderness and forgiveness and reconciliation that we really felt in that moment we had sensed again what they experienced at Azusa. 
uh, that um, there was an equality uh, among us. We were united by our faith, not by our color. And that was very, very meaningful. And so we sensed that it was a time of change. Uh, and as we look back on it, that was a significant turning point uh, in relationships between black and white Pentecostals uh, in the United States. And there was a recognition, we are, to, we are in the same room, but we really don't know one another. This is just the beginning. And indeed it has been the beginning because since 1994, we've seen, I think, a lot of progress, still a lot more to accomplish, but a lot of progress that's occurred as a result. Without the Memphis miracle, we would not be where we are at today. Not to say that it was the end of something, the accomplishment of everything that was needed, but it certainly did move us in the right direction and set the precedent for uh, black-white relationships in the Pentecostal church from that time forward. We're making some rich, wonderful plans. We're looking to go forward into the future. I'm not uh, looking back, I'm looking forward. I'm not uh, looking at the negative, I'm looking at uh, the positive, and I praise God for what he is doing, and I see us in the future, and we look much better than we look right now. I heard about this some time ago, and um, I hate racism. I, um, <clears throat> I know of this thing called identificational repentance. What it means is you're identifying with the unresolved sins of generations ago. Daniel, in the book of Daniel, Daniel prayed and he identified with the sins of the past and he asked for forgiveness. And <clears throat> I just, I've, I've, uh, I've recognized how at the very beginning of our history of the Assemblies of God, on Azusa Street, there was this movement of God that was all-powerful that's really up to this moment has changed the face of the world. But there's so much more, by the way. But it began with a black preacher who was blind in one eye. And all it was was just the hunger of people. Church of God in Christ was the name that of the organization that came out of that. But in that time, I don't make excuses for it, but there were there were white people who thought, well, you know, if we're going to reach the rest of our nation, there was, we, if we're going to reach white people, white people will come into this because it's black. It was racism. So they started out of that Church of God in Christ movement, they started the Assemblies of God. It was with a heart to reach people, but at the time they didn't realize until 1994 in Memphis when the Pentecostal Church of North America, leaders from all over came together and they recognized, wait a minute, we're all white. We need to recognize that, that there's this barrier. So Charles Blake, uh, Charles Blake, Bishop Blake and the leaders of the black Pentecostal movement came in and joined. And there was such a spirit of repentance in that place that the general superintendent, as you saw, along, knelt down at the feet of Charles Blake, the general superintendent of the Church of God in Christ, and repented. He repented for the sins of the past. He repented for the racism of the past. Now, that story moved me so much. And I, I just uh, felt in my own heart that 
if God is going to move in the Twin Cities, and if he's called me to, in any way, to be a part of pastoring the Twin Cities, we need to heal this, this, this separation, and we, we need to repent of the past. And so we had a meeting one time, and Cindy Jacobs had brought who, a man who has become a really good friend, Bishop Richard Coleman. I've had him preach here. And Bishop Rich, she invited, she invited Richard from Minneapolis, a black bishop, and then she invited me from St. Paul, a not black bishop. <laughs> she invited us as a white and a black to stand in front of everybody and join hands. And God just began to do a healing there. And then I started fellowshipping with Church of God in Christ pastors. And I formed this wonderful partnership with with Bishop Henry Brown. His daughter, Kimberly Brown, has sung here several times. And, and I just saw Kimberly this last week. And Henry and Don and Brown pray for me, and I pray for them. And, and uh, But they had, so I invited the Church of God in Christ to come here, and they had their, uh, a couple of years, they did their, districts, their district conference for the region for Church of God in Christ. They did it here at Redeeming Love. And it was so beautiful. And uh, and one of the first ones, I was sitting in the front row and, and, and the place is just filled with wonderful brothers and sisters in Christ. And on the platform, they had all of the bishops and then the general overseer. And they're all sitting in chairs up in the front. And, and I'm enjoying just this presence of the Lord. And, and then Henry Brown, Overseer Brown, just said, Pastor Mike, come on up here. We, and they invited me to come up on the platform. And, and they asked me just to say a few words. And I told them about, I said, you know, I've, been, I've my heart's been moved by the Memphis miracle. And then I, in my heart, I felt repentant and broken. Not condemned, but repentant and broken and convicted. And I turned around to all these men that were sitting on the platform and I just said, that's fine and good for Memphis, but how about Minneapolis? How about St. Paul? And uh, I felt on my heart, and I got down on my knees. I didn't have water to wash the feet, but I got down on my knees. And I was starting to sob and weep and just say, forgive us. Forgive us. We've done the same thing with the Native Americans. And we have Native Americans that are part of this congregation. I don't know our history. I don't know if you know our history, but in our history, one of the worst massacres, Native Americans, happened right here in, in Minnesota. And I just repent over that. You know, um, I repent over the, over the racism and the things that separated us. And I want to say to this congregation, just I, I believe I represent many of my race that has in some way been condescending. I repent for, for that. I repent for slavery. I repent for all of those, all the atrocities that have happened in the past. I repent for being separated. And I repent for any way that there's been, I've allowed preference or my, my group has allowed preference to separate us. I want unity with you. You know what? But to complete, I'm saying this is your pastor now, if you want to complete the picture, it's not just repentance that's needed. It's also forgiveness. We need to let go of the horrible offenses of the past. We need to let go of the horrible ways that we have offended in the past. And church, I'm so thankful for you because there, from my perspective, I don't sense any racism, but we can come on behalf of the Twin Cities and we can just say, Lord, do something in the Twin Cities. Let the name Redeeming Love be more than a name. Let it be who we are in Jesus' name. 1 Corinthians 11, the Apostle Paul said to that same church before he went into talking about the gifts and before he went and talked about the love, 1 Corinthians 11, 
Again, 12 was the gifts, 13 is the love. But in 11, he said, I've heard that there are some divisions among you. And then he took them into, but I have received of the Lord that which was given unto me, that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body. My body's broken so you could be in unity, so that you could be one. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Remember my prayer. Remember how I prayed for you to have complete unity. Complete unity. I'm praying that church for you to have it in your homes. I'm complete unity between each other. Complete unity where we don't let our personal preferences get in the way. Complete unity where there's healing. It's in that complete unity of repentance and forgiveness that there's healing and wholeness and power. So he said, here's how we're going to deal with this. Let a man examine himself. Let everyone examine their own heart before they eat of the bread and the cup. Hold up your hand if you don't have a cup, by the way. Our ushers are going to pass it out to you. If you don't have, there's some over on this side. If we have an usher over on this, all the way to my left, your right. If you don't have the communion cup, we're going to do communion now. He said, keep your hand up, and our ushers will make their way through the crowd. There's some, um, Steve, way over on this side. He said, you're not going to want, maybe you don't want to take it after I share this. He said, if you eat this and drink this, if you eat this bread and drink it in an unworthy manner, he says, you're opening yourself up to being weak. And that's why there's many weak and sick among you and many die prematurely. In other words, when we hold on to offense and will not forgive and repent, with humility. The commanded blessing is not there. The commanded blessing of God is where there's healing and wholeness. So he says, examine yourself. If you got men, if you got something that you always are striving with your wife, husbands if, and wives, if you're always striving with your husband, if you're not treating each other with honor, I would say, get it right. If you have any unforgiveness, if there's any racial preference that even made me kept you away from coming to church last week, because I just don't like it when all of that happens. That's a, that's a racial preference that separates you. I know it's comfortable to be in a church where everybody looks alike, everybody's the same age, everybody, everybody's the same age, everybody works the same jo kind of jobs, everybody's in the same neighborhood, everybody's the same economic level. And then we can all go and have fellowship and love on each other because we're all the same. And there's nothing wrong with that except that That's not what heaven looks like. Amen? So, Lord, we enter into this moment reverently, and we just say, forgive us. Forgive us. Forgive us for offending and not realizing it. Forgive us, Lord, of, of the past. We, we repent of the racism. We repent of the ageism. We repent of separating ourselves from one another. We repent of harboring strife and pride and stubbornness. Going our own way, stubborn. We repent of that. We repent of having a critical, judgmental heart. We repent of that. And Lord, as we begin 2024, Lord, may we purpose to be an answer to your prayer that we would be one like you are one. Give us complete unity by your grace.
Will you stand with me? You know, church, um, I think we already came to the altar already once. You need to go. Um, I understand it. You know, we understand, by the way, and we just pray that you be blessed. Sometimes with, there is some of your work and some of you have other things that you got to get done. And, and uh, we're right up to noon right now if you need to go. But if you have time to spend a few minutes and love on each other, can we just as a prophetic act, it's always coming forward, but I'm invite you to come on up. Anybody who wants to stand with me and say, let's let complete unity happen in our hearts. Would you just come on up? We're going to do communion at the altar today. I know we all don't fit, but some of you have to go around to the sides. you're playing. Can we sing what she's playing? This is a somber moment, and yet it's a time that's filled with your grace. Lord, we just want to say, we want to seek your power move throughout the Twin Cities. I want to see what happens here, happens in every time people come together. Lord, we are thankful for what's happening here, but Lord, we recognize that especially in the days ahead, the month and this year, when there's such a potential for extreme division, when there's such a potential for hatred, Lord, I pray that your house would be a house of unity and love. May we be one so that the world will know, so that the world will know that you are the Son of God that takes away the sins of the world. Lord, that you would wash us as a church so that the world may know that you love them. 
and that we would love each other. So we come to this altar as a prophetic act and we just say, Lord, hear my. I surrender my preference, my will, for your will to be done. We surrender our will and our preference. We repent, Lord God, of allowing anything to separate us, any of the smallest thing. Give us complete unity through your bread, through the cup, your body and blood. Would you take out that, that uh, bread, that piece of matzo? You know, Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, the Bible says he took bread and broke it. It wasn't nice and clean and nice and neat like that little circle. His body was broken. Would you break it between your fingers? Just break it. Jesus took the bread and he broke it. And then he said, this is my body, which is for you. Think of that. This is my body, which is for you. In other words, he's saying, if he, took, he takes a stripe on his back for our healing, his body was broken for our wholeness. That's why we don't enter into this without understanding that we're going to grow. It's a process, but we're going to become a complete, loving uni unity of the body of Christ. Amen? I want to see that. I didn't, I didn't express that the best way, but you understand. We're going, to, we're going to fulfill his prayer. And when we do, we're going to see commanded blessing beyond what we can ever imagine. Because it's, it's his word. It's his promise. So he took the, and he, and he held it up. I could just see him. Just hold that up reverently. And he just said, I'm going to paraphrase. You see this bread? You see this bread? I could tell him, I can imagine. Disciples, you see this? You see this bread? This bread is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Heavenly Father, right now as we take this, we recognize that you went to the cross, your body was broken, your blood was spilled. We recognize that you were wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. All those iniquities, those ways that have been within us that we weren't even aware of that were, Lord, we repent of those things and you took it all upon yourself. The chastisement of our peace was upon you. And Lord, I thank you that by your stripes we are healed. And so, Lord, I pray for healing in marriages right now. I pray for healing in homes. I pray for healing in relationships. I pray that homes would be filled with the beauty of your presence, that we would be filled with honor and love for one another, humility, honor, hope, hunger. Oh, God, oh, harmony. Lord, I just release that over everybody as we eat this bread. Let this place be filled with your glory. In Jesus' name. Let's eat together. Oh, praise your name. If you can peel back that. Remember, it's not the container. It's the content that counts, right? Jesus then took the cup and held it up. Could you do that right now? Just hold it up reverently in front of you. And Jesus said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. It wasn't just a cup. It wasn't just the cup that he was holding. Yes, it was that cup, but it wasn't just that cup. It was every cup that has been lifted up in this moment, ever since. Every time people have come together, when Jesus said, this cup is a new covenant, he's talking about the covenant that was in that, that, that cup, that bowl that he was holding in his hand, it's, and it's in the plastic cellophane thing that you're holding right now. It's in this cup that's the new covenant in his blood. And I'm saying to you, there's a new covenant that's released over your life because of the blood of the Lamb. We are one in Jesus. Let's drink together. Oh, hallelujah. Would you, with your voices, let's give him praise. Let's thank him, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Go ahead, sing that out. Thank you, Lord. Let's take just a moment right now. Would you just take a moment and just bless somebody around you? Find somebody different from you and just love on them. Let's just be one in the spirit. Can we do that? Just bless somebody. Just bless them. It might feel uncomfortable, but just reach out. Lord, make us one. Make us one. In Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, may the Lord, may his presence go with you. May he strengthen you and fill you continually. In Jesus' name. God bless you, church. God bless you.